that my legacy will be an unfinished poem. Like the ones that fill my notebook, I do not want to look back on my life and see that it could have been so much more than it turned out to be, too. My life is a series of almost. I fear that I will never know greatness, that I will not be able to stay around long enough to even become good enough to be great at anything. Three, I often feel like I do not belong. Like a concert in a library, a red dress at a funeral, I am a magnet for wide-eyed looks. People will not always tell you when your different is showing, but their eyes will. Brows raised in confusion, it is more polite to say you are one of a kind than to try understanding why. They will say you are unique. Claim variety is the spice of life. Laugh it off, then dismiss the moment because it feels too much like a turtleneck in the summertime. These compliments will always feel more like insults. Four, I am in a perpetual state of barely getting by, of trying to catch up. Ironic that someone so full speed ahead can so easily get left behind. Five, when people tell me I am amazing, I do not believe them. I smile, give thanks, and hope not to be discovered. I am a fraud. If only they knew that my accomplishments feel a lot more like accidents, as if the universe sometimes makes mistakes in my favor, like a glitch in the solar system, a data error, someone, somewhere must have spelled my name wrong. I hope no one notices. Six, the best of intentions. With the worst execution, I am what happens when a brilliant idea meets a terrible mistake. Seven, my life must look a lot like the 4th of July. Upon arrival, I light the sky bright, loud, and temporary. I am a beautiful explosion, but only for a moment. A short-lived spectacle, a pyrotechnic poet. I have always wished I were more fireplace than firework. Eight, I have a love-hate relationship with a pill bottle. I am now at 60 milligrams of Adderall a day. When I don't take it, I feel useless, but when I do, the dry mouth plagues me, and I am less myself, but I guess that is a good thing. People say they see the difference, say I am more pleasant and agreeable. Sometimes I wonder if I am medicated to make everyone else's life easier. Nine, I wish my life were easier, wish I wasn't such a problem, such a series of unfortunate events. There are only so many apologies you get until I'm sorry is no longer enough. Thank you. So with ADHD, there are good days and bad days. It's safe to say I wrote that poem on a bad day. Pushing boundaries is something that has always come naturally to me. I had displayed textbook symptoms of ADHD my entire life, but because it manifests differently in women and girls, we tend to be diagnosed a lot later in life. I wasn't diagnosed until my first year at community college. That was where I met my first boundary. After struggling to the point of tears in a remedial math class, the professor noticed that my low grades were not for a lack of effort. College had always been on my agenda. I had always dreamed of being the first in my family to earn a degree, but it was turning out to be a lot harder than I ever imagined. The professor recommended that I get evaluated for a learning disability, and I did, and the counselor I met with after that said, Angela, you know, you should really think about taking up a trade. Trade school might be best for someone like you. People with ADHD don't tend to do very well in higher education, and you don't want to set yourself up for that kind of emotional turmoil or set yourself up for failure. I don't know about you, but someone tells me I can't do something, I take great pride in proving them wrong. So when I transferred to Cal State LA in 2008, one of the first stops I made was to the Office for Students with Disabilities. I met with my counselor, Dr. Silverstein, there, and I was a very nervous and awkward transfer student who was newly diagnosed with ADHD, and I had no idea what that was going to mean for me, my family, my life, or my education. For all I knew back then, ADHD was this debilitative disease that was going to eat away at my brain and turn me into some like zombie. One of the perks of ADHD is having a very vivid imagination. But anyway, Dr. Silverstein sits me down in his office and said something to me that I'll never forget. With a smile on his face, he said, Angela, ADHD is not a prison sentence. You have a learning disability, but you are not disabled. Some people would say that you think outside the box, but it's more like you don't even really know where the box is. <laughs> and I laughed and I exhaled, and I took that mantra with me for the rest of my life. It's been a long road to self-acceptance, I will tell you that, but the thing I want you all to leave here with today is not only a sense of compassion for people who are living with ADHD and other invisible disabilities, it's the fact that my life has taken an unconventional but extraordinary path because of it. And that is because I've learned that it's okay to be different, and more important, it's okay to ask for help and accept it when you need it. ADHD is characterized by three symptoms inattention, impulsivity, and in hyperactivity. 
In my poem, I say that my life is a series of almost. One of the characteristics of ADHD is not being able to carry out tasks to full completion. Like most people with it, I've started so many projects and not finished them. Some of those being a clothing line, a film editing career, advertising school, and even a teaching credential. See, I'm an excellent starter. I can start almost anything. Starting is not the problem for me. I get ideas by the minute. But it's the finishing that always seems to elude me. For me, asking for help started with accommodations. Under the um, American Disabilities Act, employers and schools are required by law to provide people with disabilities um, accommodations to, for them to order to fun in order for them to function successfully. So what are accommodations? Accommodations are um, an alteration of an environment or a curriculum format or equipment that allows an individual with a disability to gain access to content and demonstrate their knowledge. These can include double time on tests or assignments, the use of assistive tech devices, such as an iPad or in my case today a teleprompter, the use of a quiet room free of distractions for tests, allowing students to demonstrate knowledge in unconventional ways, such as creating a video instead of writing an essay. Identifying the needs of a student is important. That's what accommodations are. It's really just identifying those needs and meeting them so that students can demonstrate their knowledge. If a child can't learn the way you teach, then you need to teach the way they learn. And that is how I feel. Accommodations don't change what you're learning. They change how you're learning it. They make it easier for someone to learn. This brings me to equality versus equity. This slide demonstrates the difference between equality and equity. Equality is treating everyone the same, but equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful. The crates these kids are standing on represent accommodations. Notice how their needs are different, but once their needs are met, their ability to access or watch the game becomes the same. Equality aims to promote fairness, but it can only work if everyone starts from the same place and needs the same help, which we know is not always the case. At Cal State LA, I learned to advocate for myself. I learned to ask for help when I needed it, and I learned that a huge part of my education was going to be me speaking up for myself in order to gain access to the curriculum. Because of that, in 2011, with the help from my family, friends, professors, and counselors, I pushed through my third boundary and graduated from this institution with my bachelor's degree in communication studies with an emphasis in rhetoric and social change. Thank you. I had finally fi started something and finished it, <laughs> but I wasn't done yet. It was 2010 and I found myself teaching poetry through a nonprofit called Collective Voices at an alternative school called Learning Works in my hometown of Pasadena. That was when I found my purpose. I wouldn't have been able to tell you back then, but teaching, teaching would be the thing that changed me. It would end up being where I felt my most beautiful. It would be where time would stop and where everything would start to make sense. But when I combined my two loves with poetry and teaching, that was where the magic really happened. For me, teaching feels a lot like flying. It's like I'm the pilot flying a plane and my students are my passengers, but I'm in control. It's my job to get them to their destination safely, which is ultimately the discovery of who they are, but the journey is up to me. But the, you know, keep in mind, flying requires grace, control, and reliability. And up until then, I'd never known that kind of grace and control. Outside of teaching, I was and still am out of control in a lot of ways. ADHD has its own special way of making you the most interesting person in any room. And by interesting, I just mean the person with the most bizarre stories. Like the time I locked my, car, my keys in my car nine times in one month. Or the time I, multiple times, I'd work all night on an essay only to get to school and realize I'd forgotten my backpack. Or the times I got my car repoed, not because I didn't have the money to pay the car payment, but because I just forgot to pay the payment three months in a row. Or how about just last week when I was headlining a university show, but I showed up 20 minutes late to my own show, not because of traffic like I had told them, but because I had misplaced my phone at work and couldn't leave without it because, duh, navigation. And I eventually found it in the refrigerator. Or the most applicable one. Last night, while I was supposed to be rehearsing for this talk, I found myself distracted by the sudden need to search the internet for today's outfit in inspiration. Obviously, by looking to my generation's undisputed style icon, the nanny. <laughs> but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Not to mention, while all these adventures are part of my daily life, my car, house, office, and head are often in complete disarray, like clothes and papers just everywhere, all the time, my friends will tell you. The point is, I had finally found my still point in my turning world. Teaching was my thing, 
and all of a sudden I'm at the head of a classroom, and all of a sudden I have the answers, me, of all people. The girl who once accidentally flushed her keys down the, car, down the toilet is suddenly po poised, calm, and wise even. But after a few years of teaching, I started to get tired, not of the kids, but of myself. It is emotionally exhausting to look, at their, to look my students in their eye week after week and sincerely tell them to follow their dreams while simultaneously running from my own. As a poetry teacher, I had created an entire contemporary class curriculum based around the poetry of my peers. I am part of the LA poetry community, and for a lot of years, I watched and cheered for my friends as they complete, competed in slams, wrote books, and were even paid to perform at huge universities. I watched them make a living out of their art, and for the longest time, I secretly wanted that for myself, but I pretended I didn't. I did that because I was scared, scared that I wasn't good enough. In my poem, I say, when people tell me I am amazing, I do not believe them. I smile, give thanks, and hope not to be discovered. I am a fraud. Truth be told, fear and inadequacy have been the prevailing themes in my own life. I have allowed fear to stop my arms from reaching so many times. A person with ADHD is six times more likely to have another psychiatric or learning disorder than most other people. ADHD usually overlaps with other disorders, so after being clinically diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and ADHD in 2008, I began therapy and medication for the long journey toward healing from the irrational scars these invisible disabilities had left behind. I began to realize that they had managed to slither their way into almost every aspect of my life, but it wasn't until I began teaching that I really began to hold myself accountable. If I was going to be a real teacher, or a good one at least, I was going to have to live up to the same standards I was holding my students to, and that means I had to try. By then, I had a whole bunch of poems, and I had been performing at open mics for at least five years. Sure, I had a lot of cool ideas, but I had to face the fact that ideas in and of themselves mean nothing. Ideas without follow through are just dreams, and dreams don't pay the rent. They don't get you a degree, they don't finish paintings or films or create movements that make the world a better place, and they damn sure don't show the world what you are capable of. Actions do. That's why, in 2015, I applied to a writing program at USC called the Community Literature Initiative. This program focuses on teaching writers in LA how to create poetry of publishable quality. The course is a 10-month training program to refine works in progress into finalized manuscripts ready for publication. They only accept 14 poetry students a year, and that year I happened to be one of them. I was scared to death that my ADHD would hold me back. I've never been a disciplined writer. I'm more of a free spirit, hippie child kind of a writer, like, yeah, man, whenever the poem comes, it just comes. <laughs> but being accepted into this program meant two things. One, that I was going to have to start considering myself a real poet, like I did my friends. And two, that I was going to have to start believing my poems were good enough to become a real book that people should actually buy with real money. Those were two things that I had never thought about before. In my poem, I say, my life must look a lot like the 4th of July. Upon the, the, my arrival, I light the sky bright, loud, and temporary. I am a beautiful explosion, but only for a mo moment. I have always wished I were more fireplace than fireworks. And that still rings true. But in 2016, my first book was published by the World States Press, and it was called Confessions of a Firework, and it was dedicated to my students. So rewind back to 2015. It may have been my newfound confidence in actually starting to take my career as a writer seriously, or combined with the lack of visibility of Latinas in the LA poetry scene, but something sparked between my friend Jessica and I. We knew we wanted to start something, we just didn't quite know what it was gonna be. It quickly morphed into a large scale version of what our friendship already was, homegirls supporting homegirls. We decided we would form a collective and so Chingona Fire was born. Chingona is a Spanish slang term meaning badass woman. How many of y'all in here are badass women? <laughs> All right, that's what I thought. So Chingona Fire is the alchemy that occurs when badass women come together and set the world on fire. So a Chingona is any woman who chooses to live her life on her own terms, period. It is not limited to Latinas. Anyone can be a Chingona. So in just one year, we curate monthly poetry events and writing workshops for women, featuring women, and produced solely by women. In just one year of existence, we've started somewhat of a movement. It's our mission to create space and visibility for and to promote solidarity among all women. And in only one year, we've had 10 sold out events in LA, been paid to perform at countless events and universities as a duo and individually. And we just recently reached 11,000 Instagram followers, which was a big deal for us. And we just got back from our first out-of-state trip. 
to Wisconsin where we were asked to be the keynote speakers of a multicultural conference at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Jessica and I both deal with depression and anxiety, so in a lot of ways we have become each other's support system. The fact is we have started a business and that was something I never thought my ADHD would allow. Starting a business requires long-term commitment, constant checking of and replying to emails, showing up on time to meetings and managing money. All things that don't come naturally to me at all. But the great thing about our partnership is that she has not tried to change me. She meets me where I'm at. She understands that my ADHD causes me to think and process things differently than she does, and she lets me stick to what I'm good at. She takes care of all the dates, but she downloaded a Google Calendar and linked our booking email to my phone so that I could feel empowered to participate in the bookings and negotiations. Together, we inspire women every day to push boundaries. With our friendship and our lives, we push the boundary of body positivity, respectability politics, and what is possible for people living with mental illness. Together, we are working toward leaving a legacy, and that is something I am truly proud of. Leaving a legacy is a lot like starting a fire. For some people, we're born with matches in their back pocket, and some of us were only given two sticks to rub together. See, the spark is the same, but if setting the spark is the journey. If you weren't one of the lucky ones, if a lighter wasn't handed down to you on a silver platter, then the best you can do is rub those two sticks together until you create a spark. And the fact of the matter is, this way may take longer, and it may be more daunting, but, but it will always mean more. And I know this, can, this analogy can frustrate us. It's not what we want to hear, but the thing is, it is the truth. The fact is, creating fire allowed the expansion of human activity to proceed into the darker and colder hours of the night. Flames are the part of the fire we can see. They can be different colors depending on what, the substance that is burning, which is to say your legacy does not have to look the same as anyone else's, and that's what we forget. My life hasn't turned out at all the way I imagined it. It has turned out better. The moment I began to embrace the part of who I am that makes me different instead of rejecting it is the moment I began to live my fullest life. The boundary of ADHD is still there every single day, but I never stop pushing back against it, and neither should you. Whether you have a learning disability or not, whether it's a mental illness or domestic violence, if you are struggling with racism, sexism, homophobia, you can't be afraid to ask for support when you need it. And you can't let the boundaries that life places in front of you stop you from becoming who you were meant to be. Last month, I received a phone call that added to my own personal legacy. California Senator Anthony Portentino had chosen to honor me as one of his 10 selected women of the year. I couldn't believe it. I was speechless, which is a state most people with ADHD don't usually find themselves in, <laughs> as you can tell by the length of this speech. But anyway, I'm not telling you this to brag. Well, of course, it is an amazing accomplishment, and I was the youngest of the recipients, so I was in the presence of some real chingonas that day, as you can see. But my point is, is that Senator Pornatino is a very established and well-respected politician. He represents California's 25th state Senate district, but his life didn't take a very conventional path either. Prior to his election to the assembly, he spent many years working in film and television as a production manager, a producer, an art director, and a location manager. As a politician, he has a long and distinguished record of public service, which includes nearly eight years on city council with two terms as mayor. And now he's a senator, an interesting path into politics. In his introduction to me that day, to everyone that day, he had a personal anecdote, but he didn't know me personally, so I was curious as to what he was going to say that day. I was the last to receive the award, and I didn't know him personally, so I was curious as what he was going to say. He revealed that he had not only read my book, but that a certain poem had struck a chord with this ADHD senator, as he called himself. I stood there in awe and listened to him finish the intro, but my mind was somewhere else. I was looking at this man who had accomplished so much in his lifetime a man who was doing so much for the community, and a man who was highly respected in his field, but I was also looking at a man with ADHD, a man who had pushed his boundaries so far back that they no longer existed. The senator had seen myself in my poem. He had seen himself in my poem. And that is why he chose to honor me that day. In that moment, I no longer felt like a fraud. I finally felt affirmed not only as a poet, but as a person who, like him, is not only living, but thriving with ADHD. And that is something that I'm very proud of. Thank you.